Welcome to Mystery Sauce. Today's episode is going to be a true crime about Charlie Scott's idyllic life on Maui, whose life took a sinister turn when her ex-boyfriend's lies and betrayal led to a brutal murder and a shocking twist involving his old family. So let's get into it. Life on the Hawaiian island of Maui is very relaxed. The North Shore of Maui is where the big waves are and that attracts surfers, beach bums, hippies, and people that are just love to enjoy life. Now Carly, known as Charlie Scott, was one of those people. Charlie was a fun loving girl that lived near the North Shore and loved the easy lifestyle of Maui. With her pinup girl looks, Charlie was known for her quirkiness, her taste in music, clothes, and her bright red hair. She loved to sing out loud and would often go out of her way to help friends and family. Charlie moved to Maui from Woodland, California in 2004. Even at 27 years old, Charlie had a childlike side to her. She had a fascination with unicorns, and her favorite movie was 1982's The Last Unicorn. She often quoted the Chinese philosopher Yu Ru, saying she was a unicorn among beasts. Unfortunately, the beast she met was named Stephen Capobianco. Now, Stephen met Charlie in 2009 when she was 22 years old, and he was just 19. Charlie was quite smitten with Stephen, and the couple moved in together and lived in the town of Kula, just a few miles up country from the beach town of Paia. Though they lived together for two full years, Stephen would often tell his friends they were just roommates, even going so far as to avoid having his picture taken with her. Though Charlie openly loved Stephen, the love was reciprocated. Stephen never told her he loved her, and according to her friends, he never showed her any affection at all, other than sex. Charlie had a motherly side to her as well. She enjoyed making Stephen's life comfortable by cooking and cleaning the house. While Stephen would spend hours in front of the television playing video games or working on his truck. Though the couple were living together, they really didn't do many activities together. To their friends' acknowledgement, Stephen was never abusive to her. But behind her back, he would tell his friends, I hate that effing bitch. When Stephen and Charlie inevitably broke up, they still had an on, again, off, again relationship for the next few years. Charlie was still in love. Even, if, even though she knew Stephen didn't care about her, and Stephen knew Charlie was always there if he needed her for sex. No matter how badly Stephen treated her, Charlie was under his spell and just couldn't seem to say no. She came running every time he would call. So in the fall of 2013, Stephen met a young blonde named Cassandra Kupastas, and the two started dating. Cassandra claimed it was love at first sight. She was living on Maui when she met Stephen, but already had plans to move back to her hometown in Pennsylvania, though they only had three weeks together before she moved 5,000 miles away. They fell very much in love. So once Cassandra got back to Pennsylvania, she and Stephen spoke on the phone via Skype one or two times a day. She had only been back a few days before they both realized that they needed to be together. They made plans for her to move back to Maui the following February. Neither Stephen nor Cassandra seemed to be the faithful type. Early on in their relationship, Stephen found out that Cassandra had cheated on him. They decided to go to a bar in the town of Makawao to drown his sours. Stephen ran into Charlie at the bar. Charlie lent a sympathetic ear and invited him over to her place. As usual, Stephen was only interested in sex, and Charlie knew she couldn't resist. The cheating was just a minor setback for Stephen and Cassandra, and they quickly patched up their relationship and continued with their plans of creating a life together. That October, just over a month after their hookup, Charlie realized she was pregnant. Though this obviously wasn't the ideal situation, Charlie had always looked forward to the idea of being a mother. So when Charlie told Stephen the news, he was less than pleased. He told her he wanted to take a paternity test to make certain he was the father. This pregnancy got directly in the way of Stephen's plans with his new love, Cassandra. So he told Charlie he would not be there for her baby and insisted that she, get, she should get an abortion. Charlie reluctantly agreed and the two went to Planned Parenthood together for a consultation. During their visit, the director of the local Planned Parenthood noticed the tension between the couple and asked Stephen if he was the father. Stephen replied, I guess so, but she's not with me. 
the director looked to Charlie and could see an obvious look of pain in her face. Steven then blurted out, we're going to go through with this, aren't we? Charlie, Charlie reluctantly agreed. And they made plans for Charlie to come back later for the procedure. Christmas dinner was held at Charlie's half-sister Fiona Wise's house. And Charlie thought this was the perfect time to announce to her family that she was now three months pregnant and she was having a baby. Charlie hadn't spoken to Steven since their appointment at Planned Parenthood. And she had since changed her mind and decided to keep the baby and raise it on her own. With or without Steven's help. She knew she would always have the support of her family and friends. Jaws dropped and mouths were wide open around the room. Charlie's family were in shock, but ultimately happy for her when they saw how excited she was. She had already found out the gender of the baby by the time and decided she was going to name him Joshua. Her half-sister Fiona was curious if Stephen knew about the baby and sent him a text. Do you realize you're, you're the father of Charlie's child? Stephen replied. What? How do you know? I thought she had taken care of it. He had no idea that Charlie had changed her mind and decided to keep the baby. When Fiona spoke to Stephen on the phone later that day, he sounded nervous and panicked, as if he couldn't believe the news. He said that he and Charlie had agreed to take care of it. He told her he had a new girlfriend and that he loved, and she was moving in with him in February, and he was worried that the baby was going to be messing up all his plans. So he ended the conversation saying, I need to talk to Charlie. So a few weeks had passed before Stephen worked up the nerves to break the news to Cassandra during the Skype sessions. Stephen explained to her that he didn't know for sure that the baby was his, and he asked Charlie to have an abortion, even taking her to the clinic himself. So Cassandra was in shock. At only 21 years old, she wasn't ready to be a stepmother, and told Stephen she didn't want to talk for a few days while she processed this news. So eventually, Cassandra called Stephen and told him she didn't want him to be a deadbeat dad and that he should take responsibility for the child. She told him that he should be there for the child, but she could tell that Stephen still wasn't ready to become a father. He told Cassandra he had no feelings for Charlie and had never had any feelings for her, explaining she was just an easy lay. On the evening of Sunday, February 9th, Charlie, her mother, and her four, four sisters all gathered at her sister's Brooke's house for a relaxed evening. They were watching Disney videos. Brooke had recently found out she was pregnant too, and they talked about their children growing up together on Maui. Brooke later recalled feeling her sister's tummy and feeling Joshua kicking. So at around 8 p.m., Charlie kissed her mother, told her she loved her, and made her way home. That will be the last time any of the family would see her. Charlie only lived a few miles away from her mother and had planned to drop off laundry with her on their way to work that Monday morning. Charlie worked as an administrator at the Hui Noao Visual Arts Center in nearby Makuao. When she didn't show up that morning, Charlie's mother, Kimberlyn, called her cell phone. She wasn't surprised when Charlie didn't answer. Charlie would have been at work by, the, by then and normally didn't answer any personal phone calls while she was working. Kimberlyn then sent her a text message knowing Charlie would respond when she had the time. So as the day progressed, Charlie's mother sent a few more texts, but each time got no reply. Charlie was a very responsible girl, and it was unusual for her not to reply. That, that was when Kimberlyn started getting worried. By 4 p.m., she already sent her daughters a several message and eventually sent one saying, where the hell are you? So by 9 p.m., Kimberlyn and the rest of the family were in full panic mode. That evening, Kimberlyn and Charlie's 16-year-old sister, Fadria, went to Charlie's house. Charlie's Toyota 4Runner wasn't there, and the doors to her home were locked. They knocked, knowing there would be no answer, but could hear one of her dogs was inside the house. So they had the keys, and they let themselves in. Upon entering the house, they found one of Charlie's dogs, Zoe, with no dog food or water. Charlie would never leave her dogs without food and water. Her second dog, Nala, was nowhere to be found. So Kimberlyn then remembered that she and Charlie sent, she had an app called Life360 that was used for families to track the location of one another, specifically for situations like this. When she checked the app, it showed the last ping from Charlie's phone was at 10.56 p.m. the night before in Kinai. Kinai was a remote area along the north shore of Maui, just a short distance from the famous road to Hana. It's a beautiful peninsula with huge waves that crash against the jagged black rocks or the shoreline. But there was really no explainable reason why Charlie would have gone there, especially that late at night. When she was five months pregnant, doesn't make sense. 
So the family hypothesized about why Charlie would possibly be out that far in the middle of the night. There was only one reason that Charlie would go see without telling anyone, and that was Stephen Campibianco. And now at 10.19 p.m. on Monday night, Kimberly sent Charlie one last text. I'm about to call the police, Charlie. Where are you? There was still no answer. Kimberly then called Maui police and reported Charlie missing. Tuesday morning, 5.30 a.m., Maui police showed up at Stephen's house to question him. He told his story and told officers it was the first time he had heard of Charlie's disappearance. Stephen said that Charlie had come over to his house Sunday night because he had asked for a ride to pick up his truck. Stephen claimed his battery cable had come loose on the road to Hana the prior day, and he left it parked on the side of the road. He needed a ride to the truck so he could fix it and drive it home. He said his truck had been stalled just a few miles past Kenai at mile marker 20. This was the same location that Charlie's mother had seen the last ping on the tracking app. And according to Stephen, Charlie drove him to his truck that night, and she didn't even need to get out of her vehicle. He claimed she shined her headlights on him while he fixed his truck, and the whole process only took a few minutes. They then drove back to, towards town in their own vehicles. Stephen said Charlie followed him on the way back, but he's, he drives faster than she does, and he lost sight of her headlights near Ulana Loop in the Twin Falls area. That would put her within 20 minutes of her home. Stephen claimed he texted her when he got home. I sent her a text that said, thank you, but I figured she was working. That's why she didn't get back to me right away. Now at daybreak, the entire family gathered friends and started the search on the island. They hoped that they would possibly find Charlie had rolled her car off the side of the road to Hana and just couldn't get to help. Search crews scoured up and down the road to Hana. They thought she could be anywhere between Hayuku and Hana, a 40 mile stretch of twists and turns, one lane bridges and sharp cliffs on the ocean side of the road. They were looking for skid marks, broken railings, broken bushes, or any sort of clue at all. They spent the entire day Tuesday searching until dark but found nothing. So by Tuesday night, friends and family had posted on Facebook and the local news stations picked up the story. Word spread fast around the island that Charlie was missing. Just a month prior, another Maui woman, Moreira Mo, months late, went missing. Speculation quickly spread that the two cases may have been related. So on Wednesday morning, there was a clue. Charlie's other dog, Nala, had been found at Naihuku Marketplace, and they were much further towards Hana. Naihuku was around 8 miles past where Steven said his truck broke down, and about 20 mi 25 miles from where he said he lost sight of Charlie's headlights that night. The man that found Nala said she was wandering around the marketplace on Monday morning. Nala's hair wasn't dirty, and her paws seemed clean and not cracked. Police knew that if a dog had traveled any distance at all in this rugged area, it would have matted hair and muddy and all cracked paws. So while it was good news that Nala was found safe, it also presented a larger problems. Her family knew that Charlie would never willingly leave Nala alone. Also it left the question of how Nala got that far down the Hana Highway without getting dirty. Someone had to have dropped her off way out there. So that same afternoon, searchers found Charlie's vehicle, her 1997 Toyota 4 Runner. It was found near the famous surf spot Jaws, flipped on its side and completely burned. Forensic experts found the use of accelerants in the passenger side and the rear of the SUV. Literally everything that was not metal was burned and completely gone. Police questioned two families that lived nearby who said they could smell the toxic smoke burning throughout the night. Charlie's father flew out from the mainland as well as many other relatives and friends. They all came to help with the search. Local Maui residents came all over the island to help, donating their horses, search dogs, and even helicopters. But family and searchers knew that that considered the evidence found at the point in the amount of time that had gone by, the chances of finding Charlie alive were very slim. Now, a search team on Thursday found a pair of jeans with bloodstains thrown alongside the Hana Highway. The size of the jeans matched Charlie's, and later an analysis showed the blood was also hers. Investigators also found the hair in the pocket of jeans. DNA was taken from the hair and it was found to match that of Steven. So late Thursday afternoon, Charlie's young sister named Fadra thought it would be best to thoroughly search the Kenai area near Naululu Bay since it was the last ping location on her cell phone. As Fadra and Brooke drove down the road to the area of Paracot Beach, they saw headlights coming up the dirt road. They instantly recognized the headlights as Steven struck. Stephen stopped them on their way down the road and told them that he had already searched that area and found nothing. He offered to search the area again with them, but Fedra 
Brooke didn't trust him and they decided to go back home. So another another of Charlie's friends, Adam Gaines, encountered Steven and heard a similar story. Another of Charlie's friends, Adam Gaines, encountered Steven and heard a similar story from him earlier that day. And later that evening, when they knew Steven wasn't in the area anymore, Phaedra took two friends back to the Parker Beach area to do their own search. The brush in the, in the area was very thick, and the three of them decided to spread out wide enough to where they could still hear each other. In just a few feet into the brush, Phaedra found something. It was a DVD of the movie Twilight. She knew that Charlie had that DVD in her car at the time she went missing. So as the three of them went deeper into the wooded area, Molly Ware found a long black skirt and a blue polka dot tank top. These were the clothes Charlie was wearing Sunday night. The skirt had at least 20 puncture marks concentrated on the abdominal area. And as they continued to search, deeper into the brush, they came to a stream and were overwhelmed by a horrible stench. Something was rotten and decomposing. Laying in the banks of the stream was a green blanket that Charlie had kept in her car. The blanket was covered with maggots. They also found a pair of Perry Ellis jeans, a gray hoodie, and two rolls of masking tape. Maui police planned a full-scale search of the area at daybreak. So the next morning, they also wanted to take a much closer look into Steven's story. That morning started a full forensic search of the area near Nahlua Bay, where Phaedra had found Charlie's items. Their extensive search found a black bra with cuts in it, five fingernails, skin fragments, clumps of red hair, a body piercing with flesh still attached to it, a bone fragment, and two halves of a lower jaw bone. DNA analysis matched them to all Charlie Scott. The forensic analysis showed the jaw bone was split into two pieces and had marks of dismemberment, blunt force trauma, and removal of flesh with a serrated edge. Though the search for more body parts continued, it was now clear Charlie had been murdered, and the case was now considered a homicide. So Maui police took their time building their case. Stephen was only listed as a person of interest, and at that point, not officially a suspect. During this time, Stephen was cocky, and he spoke with reporters repeating his story. He told reporters that he took a detector test, a lie detector test, but he was told he failed. They didn't make it take it again. I'm honestly not convinced I failed. I think they might have just said that as a tactic, but I really don't know. I'm walking around right now without handcuffs on. So more, four months after finding the jawbone, Maui police arrested Stephen for Charlie Scott's murder. He was charged with second degree murder and third degree arson. Almost every part of Stephen's story fell apart as the evidence piled up against him. Though much of the evidence against Stephen was largely circumstantial, the sheer volume of inconsistency in his story was monumental. When the FBI analyzed his cell phone usage during the time that he claimed his truck had broken down on the road to Hana, his cell phone was actually being used over 20 miles away in Hayuku near his home. Steven claimed that his friend Kyle Knight picked him up in the, in, the, in the next morning and gave him a ride to work. But Kyle testified this wasn't true. In fact, a surveillance video at a bank of Hawaii near his work at Ma Mana Foods show him driving his truck that morning at 6.41 in the morning, the same time that he claimed the truck was broken down on the Hana Highway. That same day at work, a friend of his mentioned that he left his backpack in Steven's truck, and Steven told him it was in the parking lot to go out and get his backpack. Even Steven's grandfather testified that he left the house that morning in his own truck. At the trial, local residents that traveled the road to Hana every day testified that they didn't see any vehicles broken down the road that morning. And Steven's excuse for why the vehicle broke down didn't make sense either. If a battery cable had come loose while the vehicle was running, the engine would still run until it was turned off. Another crucial mistake he made was during interviews with the police and television reporters, he mistakenly referred to Charlie in the past tense before any of the body parts were found. Now perhaps his most incriminating inconsistency was the three different stories he gave for why his hands were injured. Stephen had a Skype conversation with his girlfriend Cassandra at 2.30 in the morning, on the morning after Charlie's disappeared. He was active, frantic, and wound up, and he showed her that his hands were injured. He told Cassandra he had smashed one hand on the hood of a friend's car, and the other hand had been sliced by a battery terminal. Cassandra testified during the trial that he was kind of frantic and wound up, like someone had just got out of the car out of a car accident. In the next day, referring to the same injury, he told a co-worker at Mana Foods that he injured his hand working on the window of a friend's car. He said the cables that pulls the window up wrapped around his hand 
and he lost feeling in his hand. Experts testified during the trial that the Honda window cable is encased in an enclosure that would have made it impossible for the cable to wrap around his hand. Now, but while being interrogated by the police, he told Detective Lou that he injured his hands as a, as a baker at his work and that he sliced his pinky while working on the window of his truck, not out of friends. Basically, everything about Steven's story was proven to be a lie, and cell phone records put him in the exact remote location of Charlie's death. How exactly she was killed is still a mystery. He committed this. It is so disgusting that I, I truly, with all of my heart, believe that he never deserves to see the light of day again. And that's coming from someone that, that used to really care about Stephen. Uh, when I met him, I, I knew he was troubled, but I saw something inside him beyond his darkness that I thought maybe, just maybe, I could help him find. I was wrong. There's nothing good or decent. Rosa, you've been found guilty of murder. Murder! And still no motion at all. Anything. Nothing. She wanted to be a mom. She wanted to care and love for something and raise something that would have seen her world and seen everything around it, and it's never got to do any of that. Char you should be ashamed of yourself. Mr. Hey. Uh, you know, boy, your actions, as I've already mentioned, were senseless. They were cold. They were calculated. and self-centered. And for that, you, you must serve an extremely severe penalty. He wrote, where, 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 where is she? Where are they? What did he do with them? We've all gotten fired up a bit, so again, the, uh, a little bit of family healing and just living day to day a little bit less encumbered by all of this is uh something i hope for and on december 28 2016 after 28 days of deliberation the jury came back with a guilty verdict on both accounts stephen was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole during the conversation stephen's aunt susan was arrested when visiting Stephen at Maui Community Correctional Center. She was caught trying to pass him a package that contained 12 cigarettes, 0.3 grams of methamphetamine, marijuana, hash oil, and rolling papers. She was sentenced to 18 months in jail and four years of probation. So, that concludes our story for today. Everyone, if you're intrigued by today's true crime tale, hit that like button, it would mean a lot to me. Thank you for joining me. And until next episode, keep it saucy.